Advice to a Girl by Thomas Campion Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Never love unless you can bear with all the faults of man. Men sometimes will jealous be, though but little cause they see, And hang the head as discontent, and speak what straight they will repent. Men that but one saint adore, make a show of love to more, Beauty must be scorned in none, though but truly served in one. For what is courtship but disguise? True hearts may have dissembling eyes. Men, when their affairs require, must a while themselves retire, sometimes hunt and sometimes hawk, and not ever sit and talk. If these and such like you can bear, then like and love and never fear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. And So Did I by Isaac Jocelyn Cox, read for LibriVox.org by Maisha Thomas. Before the fire that winter's night, none seemed so sweet as she, with winning smile and dark eyes bright and playful repartee. The dancing light as round it flashed to her seemed drawing nigh. Her slender waist pressed unabashed, thus guided, so did I. It softly touched her cheeks aflame, I scarce repressed a sigh. It touched her lips, dared I the same? Too tempting, so did I. Her ruby lips, half pouting, seemed my boldness to decry. Pa's step was heard, the flame scarce gleamed, went out, and so did I. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The City of Dreadful Night by James Thompson Read for LibriVox.org by Karen Joan Kahodik Octoberzine.blogspot.com The City of Dreadful Night by James Thompson Proem Lo, thus is prostate, in the dust I write, My heart's deep languor and my soul's sad tears. Yet why evoke the specters of black night To blot the sunshine of exultant years? Why disinter dead faith from mouldering hidden? Why break the seals of mute despair unbidden, And wail life's discords into careless ears? Because a cold rage seizes one at whiles, To show the bitter old and wrinkled truth, Stripped naked of all vesture that beguiles, False dreams, false hopes, false masks, and modes of youth. Because it gives some sense of power and passion, In helpless innocence to try to fashion, Our woe in living words, howe'er uncouth. Surely I write not for the hopeful young, or those who deem their happiness of worth, or such as pasture and grow fat among the shows of life, and feel nor doubt nor dearth, or pious spirits with a God above them, to sanctify and glorify and love them, or sages who foresee a heaven on earth. For none of these I write, and none of these could read the writing if they deigned to try, so may they flourish in their due degrees, on our sweet earth and in their unplaced sky. If any cares for the weak words here written, it must be someone desolate, fate-smitten, whose faith and hope are dead, and who would die. Yet here and there some weary wanderer in that same city of tremendous night will understand the speech and feel a stir of fellowship in all disastrous fight. I suffer mute and lonely, yet another uplifts his voice to let me know a brother travels the same wild paths, though out of sight. O oh, sad fraternity, do I unfold your dolorous mystery shrouded from of yore? Nay, be assured, no secret can be told to any who divined it not before. None uninitiate by many a presage will comprehend the language of the message, although proclaimed aloud for evermore. 1. The city is of night, perchance of death, but certainly of night, for never there can come the lucid morning's fragrant breath after the dewy dawning's cold gray air. The moon and stars may shine with scorn or pity, the sun has never visited that city, for it dissolveth in the daylight fair. Dissolveth like a dream of night away, though present in distempered gloom of thought, 
a deadly weariness of heart all day. But when a dream night after night is brought throughout a week, and such weeks few or many recur each year for several years, can any discern that dream from real life and not? For life is but a dream whose shapes return, some frequently, some seldom, some by night, and some by day, some night and day, we learn, the while all change and many vanish quite. In their recurrence with recurrent changes, a certain seeming order, where this ranges, we count things real, such as memories might. A river girds the city west and south, the main north channel of a broad lagoon, regurging with the salt tides from the mouth, waste marshes shine and glisser to the moon, for leagues, then moorland black, then stony ridges, great piers and causeways, many noble bridges, connect the town and islet suburb strewn. Upon an easy slope it lies at large, and scarcely overlaps the long curved crest which swells out two leagues from the river marge. A trackless wilderness rolls north and west, savannas, savage woods, enormous mountains, bleak uplands, black ravines with torrent fountains, and eastward rolls the shipless sea's unrest. The city is not ruinous, although great ruins of an unremembered past, with others of a few short years ago, more sad, are found within its precincts vast. The street lamps always burn, but scarce a casement, in house or palace front, from roof to basement, doth glow or gleam athwart the murk air cast. The street lamps burn amid the baleful glooms, amidst the soundless solitudes immense, of ranged mansions dark and still as tombs. The silence which benumbs or strains the sense, fulfills with awe the soul's despair on weeping. Myriads of habitats are ever sleeping, or dead or fled from nameless pestilence. Yet, as in some necropolis you find, perchance, one mourner to a thousand dead, so there, worn faces that look deaf and blind like tragic masks of stone, with weary tread, each wrapped in his own doom, they wander, wander, or sit foredone and desolately ponder, through sleepless hours, with heavy drooping head. Mature men, chiefly, few in age or youth, a woman rarely, now and then a child, a child, if here the heart turns sick with ruth to see a little one from birth defiled, or lame or blind, as preordained to languish through youthless life, think how it bleeds with anguish to meet one erring in that homeless wild. They often murmur to themselves, they speak to one another seldom, for their woe broods maddeningly inward and scorns to wreak itself abroad, and if it wiles it grow to frenzy which must rave, none heeds the clamor unless there waits some victim of light glamour to rave and turn who lends attentive show the city is of night but not of sleep there sweet sleep is not for the weary brain the pitiless hours like years and ages creep a night seems termless hell this dreadful strain of thought and consciousness which never ceases or which some moment stupor but increases this worse than woe makes wretches there insane they leave all hope behind who enter there one certitude while sane they cannot leave, one anodyne for torture and despair, the certitude of death, which no reprieve can put off long, and which, divinely tender, but waits the outstretched hand to promptly render that draught whose slumber nothing can bereave. 2. Because he seemed to walk with an intent, I followed him, who, shadow-like and frail, unswervingly though slowly onward went, regardless wrapped in thought as in a veil, Thus step for step, with lonely sounding feet, we travelled many a long, dim, silent street. At length he paused, a black mass in the gloom, a tower that merged into the heavy sky. Around the huddled stones of grave and tomb, some old god's acre now corruption sty. He murmured to himself with dull despair, Your faith died, poisoned by this charnel air. Then turning to the right, went on once more, and travelled weary roads without suspense and reached at last a low wall's open door, whose villa gleamed beyond the foliage dense. He gazed and muttered with a hard despair, Here love died, stabbed by its own worshipped pair. Then turning to the right resumed his march, and travelled street and lanes with wondrous strength, until on stooping through a narrow arch, we stood before a squalid house at length. He gazed and whispered with a cold despair, Here hope died, starved out in its utmost glare. When he had spoken thus, before he stirred, I spoke, perplexed by something in the signs of desolation I had seen and heard in this drear pilgrimage to ruined shrines, where faith and love and hope are dead indeed. Can life still live? By what doth it proceed? 
as whom his one intense thought overpowers, he answered coldly, Take a watch, erase the signs and figures of the circling hours, detach the hands, remove the dial face. The works proceed until ran down, although bereft of purpose, void of use, still go. Then turning to the right paced on again, and traversed squares and travelled streets whose glooms seemed more and more familiar to my ken, and reached that sullen temple of the tombs, and paused to murmur with the old despair, here faith died, poisoned by this charnel air. I ceased to follow, for the knot of doubt was severed sharply with a cruel knife. He circled thus for ever, tracing out the series of the fraction left of life, perpetual recurrence in the scope of but three terms, dead faith, dead love, dead hope. 3. Although lamps burn along the silent streets, even when moonlight silvers empty squares, the dark holds countless lanes and close retreats. But when the night its fearless mantle wears, the open spaces yawn with gloom abysmal, the somber mansions loom immense and dismal, the lanes are black as subterranean lairs. And soon the eye a strange new vision learns, the night remains for it is dark and dense, yet clearly in this darkness it discerns, as in the daylight with its natural sense. Perceives a shade and shadow not obscurely, pursues a stir of black in blackness surely, sees spectres also in the gloom intense. The ear, too, with the silence vast and deep, becomes familiar though unreconciled, hears breathings as of hidden life asleep, and muffled throbs as of pent passions wild. Far murmurs, speech of pity or derision, but all more dubious than the things of vision, so that it knows not when it is beguiled. No time abates the first despair and awe, but wonder ceases soon. The weirdest thing is felt least strange beneath the lawless law, where death and life is the eternal king, crushed impotent beneath this reign of terror. Dazed with mysteries of woe and error, the soul is too outworn for wondering. 4. He stood alone within the spacious square, declaiming from the central grassy mound. With head uncovered and with streaming hair, as if large multitudes were gathered round, a stalwart shape, the gestures full of might, the glances burning with unnatural light. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, all was black. In heaven no single star, on earth no track. A brooding hush without a stir or note, the air so thick it clotted in my throat. And thus for hours, then some enormous things swooped past with savage cries and clanking wings. But I strode on austere, no hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, eyes of fire glared at me throbbing with the starved desire. The hoarse and heavy and carnivorous breath was hot upon me from deep jaws of death. Sharp claws, swift talons, fleshless fingers cold, plucked at me from the bushes, tried to hold. But I strode on austere. No hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, lo you, there, that hillock burning with a brazen glare, those myriad dusky flames with points aglow, which writhed and hissed and darted to and fro, a sabbath of the serpents heard pell-mell for devil's roll-call and some feet of hell. Yet I strode on austere, no hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, meteors ran and crossed their javelins on the black sky span, the zenith opened to a gulf of flame, the dreadful thunderbolts jarred earth's fixed frame, the ground all heaved in waves of fire that surged, and weltered round me soul there unsubmerged. Yet I strode on austere, no hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, air once more, and I was close upon a wild seashore. Enormous cliffs arose on either hand, the deep tide thundered up a league-broad strand, White foam belts seethed there, wan spray swept and flew, the sky broke, moon and stars and clouds and blue, yet I strode on austere, no hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, on the left the sun arose and crowned a broad crag cleft, and there stopped and burned out black, except a rim, a bleeding eyeless socket red and dim, whereon the moon fell suddenly southwest, and stood above the right-hand cliffs at rest. Yet I strode on austere, no hope could have no fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, from the right a shape came slowly with a ruddy light, a woman with a red lamp in her hand, 
bareheaded and barefooted on that strand. O desolation moving with such grace, O anguish with such beauty in thy face, I fell as on my bier, hope travailed with such fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, I was twain, two selves distinct that cannot join again, one stood apart and knew but could not stir, and watched the other stark and swoon and her, and she came on and never turned aside, between such moon and sun and roaring tide, and as she came more near, my soul grew mad with fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, hell is mild and piteous matched with that accursed wild, a large black sign was on her breast that bowed, a broad black band ran down her snow-white shroud, that lamp she held was her own burning heart, whose blood drops trickled step by step apart, the mystery was clear, mad rage had swallowed fear. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, by the sea she knelt and bent above that senseless me, those lamp drops fell upon my white brow there, she tried to cleanse them with her tears and hair, she murmured words of pity, love, and woe, she heeded not the level rushing flow, and mad with rage and fear I stood stone-bound so near. As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, when the tide swept up to her there kneeling by my side, she clasped that corpse like me, and they were borne away, and this vile me was left forlorn. I knew the whole sea cannot quench that heart, or cleanse that brow, or wash those two apart. They love, their doom is drear, yet they not hope nor fear. But I, what do I hear? 5. How he arrives there none can clearly know, athwart the mountains and immense wild tracks, or flung a waif upon that vast sea flow, or down the river's boiling cataracts. To reach it is as dying fever stricken, to leave it slow faint birth intense pangs quicken, and memory swoons in both the tragic acts. But being there one feels a citizen, escape seems hopeless to the heart forlorn. Can death and life be brought to life again? And yet release does come, there comes a morn, when he awakes from slumbering so sweetly, that all the world is changed for him completely. And he is verily as if newborn. He scarcely can believe the blissful change, he weeps perchance who wept not while accursed. Never again will he approach the range infected by that evil spell now burst. Poor wretch! Who once had place that dolent city shall pace it often doomed beyond all pity with horror ever deepening from the first though he possessed sweet babes and loving wife a home of peace by loyal friendships cheered and love them more than death or happy life they shall avail not he must dree his weird renounce all blessings for that imprecation steal forth and haunt that builded desolation of woe and terrors and thick darkness reared six I sat forlornly by the riverside, and watched the bridge lamps glow like golden stars, above the blackness of the swelling tide, down which they struck rough gold and ruddier bars, and heard the heave and plashing of the flow against the wall a dozen feet below. Large elm trees stood along that river walk, and under one, a few steps from my seat, I heard strange voices join in stranger talk, although I had not heard approaching feet. These bodiless voices in my waking dream flow dark wards blending with somber stream. And you have after all come back, come back. I was about to follow on your track. And you have failed. Our spark of hope is black. That I have failed is proved by my return. The spark is quenched, nor evermore will burn. But listen, and the story you shall learn. I reached the portal common spirits fear, and read the words above it, dark and clear. Leave hope behind, all ye who enter here. And would have passed in, gratified to gain that positive eternity of pain, instead of this insufferable inane. A demon warder clutched me, not so fast, first leave your hopes behind. But years have passed since I left all behind me, to the last. You cannot count for hope, with all your wit, this bleak despair that drives me to the pit. How could I seek to enter void of it? He snarled. What thing is this which apes a soul, and would find entrance to our gulf of dole, without the payment of the settled toll? Outside the gate he showed an open chest. Here pay their entrance fees the souls unblessed. Cast in some hope, you enter with the rest. This is Pandora's box, whose lid shall shut, and Hellgate too, when hopes have filled it. But they are so thin that it will never glut. I took a few steps backwards, desolate, and watched the spirits pass me to their fate and fling off hope, and enter at the gate. 
When one casts off a load, he springs upright, squares back his shoulders, breathes with all his might, and briskly paces to forward strong and light. But these, as if they took some burden bowed, the whole frame sank, however strong and proud, before they crept in quite infirm and cowed. And as they passed me, earnestly from each a morsel of his hope I did beseech, to pay my entrance, but all mocked my speech. No one would cede a little of his store, though knowing that in instance three or four he must resign the whole for evermore. So I return, our destiny is fell, for in this limbo we must ever dwell, shut out alike from heaven and earth and hell. The other sighed back, Yea, but if we grope with care through all this limbo's dreary scope, we may yet pick up some minute lost hope, and sharing it between us entrance win, in spite of fiends so jealous for gross sin, let us without delay our search begin. 7. Some say that phantoms haunt those shadowy streets, and mingle freely there with sparse mankind, and tell of ancient woes and black defeats, and murmur mysteries in the grave enshrined. But others think them visions of illusion, or even men gone far in self-confusion, no man there being wholly sane in mind. And yet a man who raves, however mad, who bears his soul and tells of his own fall, reserves some inmost secret, good or bad, the phantoms have no reticence at all. The nudity of flesh will blush, though tameless. The extreme nudity of bone grins shameless. The unsexed skeleton mocks shroud and pall. I have seen phantoms there that were as men, and men that were as phantoms flit and roam, marked shapes that were not living to my ken, caught breathings acrid as with dead sea foam. The city rests for man so weird and awful, that his intrusion there might seem unlawful, and phantoms there may have their proper home. 8. While I still lingered on that river walk, and watched the tide as black as our black doom, I heard another couple join in talk, and saw them to the left hand in the gloom, seated against an elm bowl on the ground, their eyes intent upon the stream profound. I never knew another man on earth, but had some joy and solace in his life, some chance of triumph in the dreadful strife. My doom has been unmitigated dearth. We gaze upon the river, and we note the various vessels large and small that float, Ignoring every wrecked and sunken boat. And yet I ask no splendid dower, No spoil of sway or fame or rank or even wealth, But homely love with common food and health, And nightly sleep to balance daily toil. This all too humble soul would arrogate Into itself some signalizing hate From the supreme indifference of fate. Who is most wretched in this dolorous place? I think myself. Yet I would rather be my miserable self than he than he who formed such creatures to his own disgrace. The vilest thing must be less vile than thou, from whom it had its being, God and Lord, creator of all woe and sin, abhorred, malignant, and implacable. I vow, that not for all thy power furled and unfurled, for all the temples to thy glory built, would I assume the ignominious guilt of having made such men in such a world. As if a being god or fiend could reign, at once so wicked, foolish, and insane, as to produce men whom he might refrain. The world rolls round for ever like a mill, it grinds out death and life and good and ill, it has no purpose, heart, or mind, or will. While air of space and time's full river flow, the mill must blindly whirl unresting so. It may be wearing out, but who can know? Man might know one thing were his sight less dim, that it whirls not to suit his petty whim, that it is quite indifferent to him. Nay, does it treat him harshly as he saith? It grinds him some slow years of bitter breath, then grinds him back into eternal death. 9. It is full strange to him who hears and feels, when wandering there in some deserted street, the booming and the jar of ponderous wheels, the trampling clash of heavy iron-shod feet. Who is this Venice of the Black Sea rideth? Who in this city of the stars abideth to buy or sell as those in daylight sweet? The rolling thunder seems to fill the sky as it comes on, the horses snort and strain, the harness jingles as it passes by, the hugeness of an overburthened wain. A man sits nodding on the shaft or trudges, three parts asleep beside his fellow drudges. And so it rolls into the night again. What merchandise? Whence, whither, and for whom? Perchance it is a fate-appointed hearse, bearing away to some mysterious tomb, or limbo of the scornful universe, the joy, the peace, the life, hope, the abortions, of all things good which should have been our portioned, but have been strangled by that city's curse. 10. 
the mansion stood apart in its own ground in front thereof a fragrant garden lawn high trees about it and the whole walled round the massy iron gates were both withdrawn and every window of its front shed light portentous in that city of the night but though thus lighted it was deadly still as all the countless bulks of solid gloom perchance a congregation to fulfil solemnities of silence in this doom mysterious rites of dolor and despair permitting not a breath or chant of prayer broad steps ascended to a terrace broad whereon lay still light from the open door the hall was noble and its aspect odd hung round with heavy black from dome to floor and ample stairways rose to left and right whose balustrades were also draped with night i paced from room to room from hall to hall nor any life throughout the maze discerned but each was hung with its funereal pall and held a shrine around which tapers burned with picture or with statue or with bust all copied from the same fair form of dust a woman very young and very fair beloved by bounteous life and joy and youth and loving these sweet lovers so that care and age and death seem not for her in sooth alike as stars all beautiful and bright these shapes lit up that mausoleum night at length i heard a murmur as of lips and reached an open oratory hung with heaviest blackness of the holy clips beneath the dome a fuming censer swung and one lay there upon a low white bed with tapers burning at the foot and head the lady of the images supine death still life sweet with folded palms she lay and kneeling there is at a sacred shrine a young man wan and worn who seemed to pray a crucifix of dim and ghostly white surmounted the large altar left at night the chambers of the mansion of my heart and every one whereof thine image dwells are black with grief eternal for thy sake the inmost oratory of my soul wherein thou ever dwellest quick or dead is black with the grief eternal for thy sake i kneel beside thee and i clasp the cross with eyes forever fixed upon that face so beautiful and dreadful in its calm i kneel here patient as thou liest there as patient as a statue carved in stone of adoration and eternal grief while thou dost not awake i cannot move and something tells me thou will never wake and i alive feel turning into stone most beautiful were death to end my grief most hateful to destroy the sight of thee dear vision better than all death or life but i renounce all choice of life or death for either shall be ever at thy side and thus in bliss or woe be ever well he murmured thus and thus in monotone intent upon that uncorrupted face entranced except his moving lips alone i glided with hushed footsteps from the place this was the festival that filled with light that palace in the city of the night eleven what men are they who haunt these fatal glooms and fill their living mouths with dust of death and make their habitations in the tombs and breathe eternal sighs with mortal breath and pierce life's pleasant veil of various error to reach that void of darkness and old terror wherein expire the lamps of hope and faith they have much wisdom yet they are not wise they have much goodness yet they do not well the fools we know have their own paradise the wicked also have their proper hell they have much strength but still their doom is stronger much patience but their time endureth longer much valour but life mocks it with some spell they are most rational and yet insane an outward madness not to be controlled a perfect reason in the central brain which has no power but sitteth wan and cold and sees the madness and foresees as plainly the ruin in its path and trieth vainly to cheat itself refusing to behold and some are great in rank and wealth and power and some renowned for genius and for worth and some are poor and mean who brood and cower and shrink from notice and accept all dearth of body heart and soul and leave to others all boons of life yet these and those are brothers the saddest and the weariest men on earth twelve our isolated units could be brought to act together for some common end for one by one each silent with his thought i marked a long loose line approach and wend athwart the great cathedral's cloistered square and slowly vanish from the moonlit air then i would follow in among the last and in the porch a shrouded figure stood who challenged each one pausing ere he passed with deep eyes burning through a blank white hood whence come you in the world of life and light to this our city of tremendous night from pleading in a senate of rich lords for some scant justice to our countless hordes who toil half starved with scarce a human right i wake from daydreams to this real night from wandering through many a solemn scene of opium visions with a heart serene an intellect miraculously bright 
I wake from daydreams to this real night. From making hundreds laugh and roar with glee, By my transcendent feats of mimicry, And humor wanton as an elvish sprite, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From prayer and fasting in a lonely cell, Which brought an ecstasy ineffable Of love and adoration and delight, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From ruling on a splendid kingly throne, A nation which beneath my rule has grown Year after year in wealth and arts and might, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From preaching to an audience fired with faith, The Lamb who died to save our souls from death, Whose blood hath washed our scarlet sins wool white, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From drinking fiery poison in a den Crowded with tawdry girls and squalid men, Who hoarsely laugh and curse and brawl and fight, I wake from daydreams to this real night. From picturing with all beauty and all grace First Eden and the parents of our race, a luminous rapture unto all men's sight. I wake from daydreams to this real night. From writing a great work with patient plan To justify the ways of God to man, And show how ill must fade and perish quite. I wake from daydreams to this real night. From desperate fighting with a little band Against the powerful tyrants of our land, To free our brethren in their own despite. I wake from daydreams to this real night. Thus, challenged by that warder, sad and stern, each one responded with his countersign, then entered the cathedral, and in turn I entered also, having given mine, but lingered near until I heard no more, and marked the closing of that massive door. 13. Of all things human which are strange and wild, this is perchance the wildest and most strange, and showeth man most utterly beguiled, to those who haunt that sunless city's range, that he bemoans himself for I, repeating how time is deadly swift, how life is fleeting, how not is constant on the earth but change. The hours are heavy on him in the days, the burden of the months he scarce can bear, and often in his secret soul he prays to sleep through barren periods unaware, arousing at some longed-for date of pleasure, which having passed and yielded him small treasure, he would outsleep another term of care. Yet in his marvellous fancy he must make quick wings for time, and see it fly from us, this time which crawleth like a monstrous snake, Wounded and slow and very venomous, Which creeps blind-worm-like round the earth and ocean, Distilling poison at each painful motion, And seems condemned to circle ever thus. And since he cannot spend and use aright The little time here given him in trust, But wasteth it in weary undelight, Of foolish toil and treble, strife and lust, He naturally claimeth to inherit the everlasting future, That his merit may have full scope, As surely is most just. O length of the intolerable hours! O nights that are as eons of slow pain! O time too ample for our vital powers! O life whose woeful vanities remain immutable for all of all our legions, through all the centuries and in all the regions! Not of your speed and variance we complain. We do not ask a longer term of strife, weakness and weariness and nameless woes. We do not claim renewed and endless life when this which is our torment here shall close, an everlasting conscious inanition. We yearn for speedy death and full fruition, dateless oblivion and divine repose. 14. Large glooms were gathered in the mighty fane, with tinted moon gleams slanting here and there, and all was hush, no swelling organ strain, no chant, no voice or murmuring of prayer, no priests came forth, no tinkling censers fumed, and the high altar space was unillumed. Around the pillars and against the walls leaned men in shadows, others seemed to brood, bent or recumbent in secluded stalls. Perchance they were not a great multitude, save in that city of so lonely streets, where one may count up every face he meets. All patiently awaited the event, without a stir or sound, as if no less self-occupied, doom-stricken while attent. And then we heard a voice of solemn stress from the dark pulpit, and our gaze there met, two eyes which burned as never eyes burned yet. Two steadfast and intolerable eyes, burning beneath a broad and rugged brow, the head behind it of enormous size, and his black fir groves and a large wind bow, a rooted congregation, gloom arrayed, by that great sad voice deep and full were swayed. O melancholy brothers, dark, 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 O battling in black floods without an ark, O spectral wanderers of unholy night, my soul hath bled for you these sunless years, With bitter blood drops running down like tears, O oh, dark, 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 withdrawn from joy and light. My heart is sick with anguish for your bale, Your woe hath been my anguish, 
yea, I quail and perish in your perishing unblessed. And I have searched the heights and depths, the scope of all our universe, with desperate hope to find some solace for your wild unrest. And now at last authentic word I bring, witnessed by every dead and living thing, good tidings of great joy for you, for all. There is no God, no fiend with names divine, made us and tortures us. If we must pine, it is to satiate no being's gall. It was the dark delusion of a dream, that living person conscious and supreme, whom we must curse for cursing us with life, whom we must curse because the life he gave could not be buried in the quiet grave, could not be killed by poison or the knife. This little life is all we must endure, the grave's most holy peace is ever sure. We fall asleep and never wake again. Nothing is of us but the mouldering flesh, whose elements dissolve and merge afresh, in earth, air, water, plants, and other men. We finish thus, and all our wretched race shall finish with its cycle, and give place to other beings with their own time doom. Infinite eons ere our kind began, infinite eons after the last man has joined the mammoth in earth's tomb and womb. We bow down to the eternal laws, which never had for man a special clause of cruelty or kindness, love or hate. If toads and vultures are obscene to sight, if tigers burn with beauty and with might, is it by favor or by wrath of fate? All substance lives and struggles evermore, through countless shapes continually at war, by countless interactions interknit. If one is born a certain day on earth, all times and forces tended to that birth, not all the world could change or hinder it. I find no hint throughout the universe of good or ill, of blessing or of curse. I find alone necessity supreme, with infinite mystery, abysmal, dark, unlighted ever by the faintest spark, for us the flitting shadows of a dream. O oh, brothers of sad lives, they are so brief. A few short years must bring us all relief. Can we not bear these years of laboring breath? But if you would not this poor life fulfill, lo, you are free to end it when you will, without the fear of waking after death. The organ-like vibrations of his voice thrilled to the vaulted aisles and died away. The yearning of the tones which bade rejoice was sad and tender as a requiem lay. Our shadowy congregation rested still, as brooding on that, end it when you will. 15. Wherever men are gathered, all the air is charged with human feeling, human thought. Each shout and cry and laugh, each curse and prayer, are into its vibrations surely wrought. Unspoken passion, wordless meditation, are breathed into it with our respiration. It is with our life fraught and overfraught. So that no man there breathes earth's simple breath, as if alone on mountains or wide seas, but nourishes warm life or hastens death, with joys and sorrows, health and foul disease, wisdom and folly, good and evil labors. Incessant of his multitudinous neighbors, he is in turn affecting all of these. That city's atmosphere is dark and dense, although not many exiles wander there, with many a potent evil influence, each adding poison to the poisoned air. Infections of unutterable sadness, infections of incalculable madness, infections of incurable despair. 16. Our shadowy congregation rested still, as musing on that message we had heard, and brooding on that, end it when you will. Perchance awaiting yet some other word, when keen as lightning through a muffled sky sprang forth a shrill and lamentable cry, the man speaks soothe, alas, the man speaks soothe, we have no personal life beyond the grave. There is no God, fate knows nor wrath nor roof, can I find here the comfort which I crave? In all eternity I had one chance, one few years' term of gracious human life. The splendors of the intellect's advance, the sweetness of the home with babes and wife, the social pleasures with their genial wit, the fascination of the worlds of art, the glories of the worlds of nature, lit by large imagination's glowing heart, the rapture of mere being full of health, the careless childhood and the ardent youth, the strenuous manhood winning various wealth, the reverend age serene with life's long truth. All the sublime prerogatives of man, the storied memories of the times of old, the patient tracking of the world's great plan through sequences and changes myriadfold. This chance was never offered me before, for me this infinite past is blank and dumb. This chance recurreth never, never more. Blank, blank for me the infinite to come. And this sole chance was frustrate from my birth, a mockery, a delusion, and my breath of noble human life upon this earth so racks me that I sigh for senseless death. My wine of life is poison mixed with gall. My noonday passes in a nightmare dream. I worse than lose the years which are my all. 
what can console me for the loss supreme? Speak not of comfort where no comfort is. Speak not at all. Can words make foul things fair? Our life's a cheat, our death a black abyss. Hush and be mute, envisioning despair. The vehement voice came from the northern isle, rapid and shrill to its abrupt harsh close, and none gave answer for a certain while, for words must shrink from these most wordless woes. At last the pulpit speaker simply said, with humid eyes and thoughtful drooping head, My brother, my poor brothers, it is thus. This life whole itself holds nothing good for us, but ends soon and never more can be, and we knew nothing of it ere our birth, and shall know nothing when consigned to earth. I ponder these thoughts, and they comfort me. 17. How the moon triumphs through the endless nights! How the stars throb and glitter as they wheel their thick processions of supernal lights around the blue vault obdurate as steel! And men regard with passionate awe and yearning the mighty marching and the golden burning, and think the heavens respond to what they feel. Boats gliding like dark shadows of a dream are glorified from vision as they pass, the quivering moon bridge on the deep black stream, cold windows kindle their dead glooms of glass to restless crystals, cornice dome and column emerge from chaos in the splendor solemn, like fairy lakes gleam lawns of dewy grass. With such a living light these dead eyes shine, these eyes of sightless heaven, that as we gaze, we read a pity, tremulous, divine, or cold majestic scorn in their pure rays. Fond man, they are not hardy, are not tender, there is no heart or mind in all their splendor. They thread mere puppets all their marvelous maze. If we could near them with the flight unflown, we should but find them worlds as sad as this, or suns all self-consuming like our own, and ringed by planet worlds as much amiss. They wax and wane through fusion and confusion. The spheres eternal are a grand illusion. The Empyrean is a void abyss. 18. I wandered in a suburb of the north, and reached a spot, whence three closed lanes led down, beneath thick trees and hedgerows winding forth, like deep brook channels deep and dark and loun, the air above was wan with misty light, the dull gray south showed one vague blur of white. I took the left-hand path and slowly trod its earthen footpath, brushing as I went the humid leafage, and my feet were shod with heavy languor, and my frame downbent, with infinite sleepless wearings outworn, so many nights I thus had paced forlorn. After a hundred steps I grew aware of something crawling in the lane below. It seemed a wounded creature prostrate there, that sobbed with pangs in making progress slow. The hind limbs stretched to push, the forelimbs then to drag, for it would die in its own den. But coming level with it, I discerned that it had been a man, for at my tread it stopped in its sore travail and half turned, leaning upon its right and raised its head, and with the left hand twitched back as an ire, Long, gray, unreverend locks befouled with mire. A haggard, filthy face with bloodshot eyes, An infamy for manhood to behold. He gasped all trembling, What? You want my prize? You leave to rob me wine and lust and gold, And all that men go mad upon, Since you have traced my secret scent of the clue? You think that I am weak and must submit, Yet I but scratch you with this poisoned blade, And you are as dead as if I clove with it That false, fierce, greedy heart. Betrayed, betrayed, I fling this phial if you seek to pass, And you are forthwith shriveled up like grass. And then with sudden change, take thought, take thought, Have pity on me, it is mine alone. If you could find it, it would avail you not. Seek elsewhere on the pathway of your own, For who of mortal or mortal race The life-track of another can retrace? Did you but know my agony and toil, Two lanes diverge up yonder from this lane. My thin blood marks the long length of their soil. Such clue I left who sought my clue in vain. My hands and knees are worn both flesh and bone. I cannot move but with continuous moan. But I am in the very way at last to find the long-lost broken golden thread which unites my present with my past, if you but go your own way. And I said, I will retire as soon as you have told whereunto leadeth this lost thread of gold. And so you know it not, he hissed with scorn. I feared you, imbecile. It leads me back from this accursed night without a morn, and through the deserts which have else no track, and through vast wastes of horror-haunted time, to Eden innocent in Eden's clime. And I become a nursling, soft and pure, an infant cradled on its mother's knee, without a past, love cherished and secure, which if I saw this loathsome present me, would plunge its face into the pillowing breast, and scream abhorrence hard to lull to rest. 
He turned to grope, and I retiring brushed thin shreds of gossamer from off my face, and mused. His life would grow, the German crushed. He should to antenatal night retrace, and hide his elements in that large womb, beyond the reach of man-evolving doom. And even thus, what weary way were planned, to seek oblivion through the far-off gate of birth, when that of death is close at hand. For this is the law, if law there be in fate. What never has been, yet may have its when. The thing which has been, never is again. 19. The mighty river flowing dark and deep, with ebb and flood from the remote sea tides, vague sounding th through the city's sleepless sleep, is named the river of the suicides. For night by night some lord wretch over-weary, and shuddering from the future yet more dreary, within its cold secure oblivion hides. One plunges from a bridge's parapet, as if by some blind and sudden frenzy hurled. Another wades in slow, with purpose set, until the waters are above him furled. Another in a boat, with dreamlike motion, glides drifting down into the desert ocean, to starve or sink from out the desert world. They perish from their suffering surely thus, for none beholding them attempts to save, the while thinks how soon solicitous he may seek refuge in the selfsame wave. Some hour when tired of ever vain endurance, impatience will forerun the sweet assurance of perfect peace eventual in the grave. When this poor tragic farce has palled us long, why actors and spectators do we stay? To fill our so short rolls out right or wrong, to see what shifts are yet in the dull play for our illusion, to refrain from grieving dear foolish friends by our untimely leaving. But those asleep at home, how blessed they are. Yet it is but for one night after all, what matters one brief night of dreary pain, when after it the weary eyelids fall upon the weary eyes and wasted brain, and all sad scenes and thoughts and feelings vanish, in that sweet sleep no power can ever banish, the one best sleep which never wakes again. 20. I sat me weary on a pillar's base, and leaned against the shaft, for broad moonlight o'erflowed the peacefulness of cloistered space, a shore of shadow slanting from the right, the great cathedral's western front stood there, a wave-worn rock in that calm sea of air. Before it, opposite my place of rest, two figures faced each other, large, austere, a couch and sphinx in shadow to the breast, an angel standing in the moonlight clear, so mighty by magnificence of form, they were not dwarfed beneath that mass enorm. Upon the cross-hilt of the naked sword, the angel's hands, as prompt to smite, were held. His vigilant, intense regard was poured upon the creature placidly unquelled, whose front was set at level gaze which took, no heed of aught, a solemn trance-like look. And as I pondered these opposed shapes, my eyelids sank in stupor, that dull swoon which drugs and with a leaden mantle drapes the outworn to worse weariness. But soon a sharp and clashing noise the stillness broke, and from the evil lethargy I woke. The angel's wings had fallen stone on stone, and lay there shattered, hence the sudden sound. A warrior leaning on his sword alone now watched the sphinx with that regard profound. The sphinx unchained looked forthright as aware of nothing in the vast abyss of air. Again I sank in that repose unsweet, again a clashing noise my slumber rent. The warrior's sword lay broken at his feet. An unarmed man with raised hands impotent now stood before the sphinx, which ever kept such mien as of open eyes it slept. My eyelids sank in spite of wonder groan. A larder crash up startled me in dread. The man had fallen forward stone on stone, and lay there shattered, with his trunkless head between the monster's large quiescent paws, beneath its grand front changeless as life's laws. The moon had circled westward full and bright, and made the temple front a mystic dream, and bathed the whole enclosure with its light, the sordid angel's wrecks, the sphinx supreme. I pondered long that cold majestic face, whose vision seemed of infinite void space. 21. And near the center of that northern crest stands out a level upland bleak and bare, from which the city east and south and west sinks gently in long waves, and throned there an image sits, stupendous, superhuman, the bronze colossus of a winged woman, upon a graded granite base four square. Low-seated, she leans forward massively, with cheek unclenched left hand, the forearm's might erect, its elbow on a rounded knee. Across a clasped book in her lap, the right upholds a pair of compasses. She gazes with full-set eyes, but wandering in thick mazes, of somber thought beholds no outward sight. Words cannot picture her, 
but all men know that solemn sketch the pure sad artist wrought three centuries and threescore years ago with fantasies of his peculiar thought the instruments of carpentry and science scattered about her feet in strange alliance with the keen wolfhound sleeping undistraught scales hourglass bell and magic square above the grave and solid infant perched beside with open winglets that might bear a dove intent upon its tablets heavy-eyed her folded wings as of a mighty eagle but all too impotent to lift the regal robustness of her earth-born strength and pride and with those wings and that light wreath which seems to mock her grand head and the knotted frown of forehead charged with baleful thoughts and dreams the household bunch of keys the housewife's gown voluminous indented and yet rigid as if a shell of burnished metal frigid the feet thick shod to tread all weakness down the comet hanging o'er the waste dark seas the massy rainbow curved in front of it beyond the village with the masts and trees the snaky imp dog-headed from the pit bearing upon its bat-like leathern pinions her name unfolded in the sun's dominions the melancholia that transcends all wit thus has the artist copied her and thus surrounded to expound her form sublime her fate heroic and calamitous fronting the dreadful mysteries of time unvanquished in defeat and desolation undaunted in the hopeless conflagration of the day setting on her baffled prime baffled and beaten back she works on still weary and sick of soul she works the more sustained by her indomitable will the hand shall fashion and the brain shall pour and all her sorrow shall be turned to labour till death the friend foe piercing with his sabre that mighty heart of hearts ends bitter war but as if blacker night could dawn on night with tenfold gloom on moonless night unstarred a sense more tragic than defeat and blight more desperate than strife with hope debarred more fatal than the adamantine never encompassing her passionate endeavour dawns glooming in her tenebrous regard to sense that every struggle brings defeat because fate holds no prize to crown success that all the oracles are dumb or cheat because they have no secrets to express that none can pierce the vast black veil uncertain because there is no light beyond the curtain that all is vanity and nothingness titanic from her high throne in the north that city's sombre patroness and queen in bronze sublimity she gazes forth over her capital of teen and threen over the river with its isles and bridges the marsh and moorland to the stern rock bridges confronting them with a coeval mien the moving moon and stars from east to west circle before her in the sea of air shadows and gleams glide round her solemn rest her subjects often gaze up to her there the strength to drink new strength of iron endurance the weak new terrors all renewed assurance and confirmation of the old despair end of the city of dreadful night by james thompson this recording is in the public domain Cumbie Chance by A. B. Banjo Patterson Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles Cumbie Chance As I pondered very weary o'er a volume long and dreary, for the plot was void of interest, t'was the postal guide, in fact, there I learnt the true location, distance, size, and population of each township, town, and village, in the radius of the act and i learnt that puckawidgee stands beside the murrumbidgee and that Bullaroy and bumble get their letters twice a year also that the post inspector when he visited collector closed the office up in stanter and reopened dungalier but my languid mood forsook me when i found a name that took me quite by chance i came across it cumby chance was what i read no location was assigned it not a thing to help one find it just an n which stood for northward and the rest was all unsaid i shall leave my home and forthward wander stoutly to the northward till i come by chance across it and i'll straightway settle down for there can't be any hurry nor the slightest cause for worry where the telegraph don't reach you nor the railways run to town and one's letters and exchanges come by chance across the ranges where a wiry young australian leads a pack horse once a week and the good news grows by keeping and you're spared the pain of weeping over bad news when the mailman drops the letters in the creek 
But I fear and more's the pity that there's really no such city, for there's not a man can find it of the shrewdest folk I know. Come be chance, be sure it never means a land of fierce endeavour, it is just the careless country where the dreamers only go. Though we work and toil and hustle in our life of haste and bustle, all that makes our life worth living comes unstriven for and free. Men may weary and importune, but the fickle goddess fortune deals him out his pain and pleasure, careless what his worth may be. All the happy times entrancing, days of sport and nights of dancing, moonlit rides and stolen kisses, pouting lips and loving glance, when you think of these be certain you have looked behind the curtain, you have had the luck to linger just a while in cumby chance. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Criticism of Critics by Robert Fuller Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk How often have the critics, trained to look upon the sky, through telescopes securely chained, forgot the naked eye? Within the compass of their glass, each smallest star they knew, and not a meteor could pass, but they were looking through when a new planet shed its rays beyond their field of vision and simple folk ran out to gaze they laughed in high derision they railed upon the senseless throng who cheered the brave new light and yet the learned men were wrong the simple folk were right end of poem this recording is in the public domain Each in His Own Tongue by William Herbert Carruth Read for LibriVox.org by Maisha Thomas A fire mist and a planet, a crystal and a cell, a jellyfish and a saurian, and caves where the cavemen dwell, then a sense of law and beauty, and a face turned from the clod. Some call it evolution, and others call it God a haze on the far horizon the infinite tender sky the ripe rich tint of the cornfields and the wild geese sailing high and all over upland and lowland the charm of the golden rod some of us call it autumn and others call it god like tides on a crescent sea beach when the moon is new and thin into our hearts high yearnings come welling and surging in come from the mystic ocean whose rim no foot has trod some of us call it longing and others call it god a picket frozen on duty a mother starved for her brood socrates drinking the hemlock and jesus on the rood and millions who humble and nameless the straight hard pathway plod some call it consecration, and others call it God. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Flying Gang by A. B. Banjo Patterson Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles The Flying Gang A Railroad Song I served my time in the days gone by in the railway's clash and clang, and I worked my way to the end, and I was the head of the flying gang. Twas a chosen band that was kept at hand in case of an urgent need. Was it south or north we were started forth, and away at our utmost speed. If word reached town that a bridge was down, the imperious summons rang. Come out with the pilot engine sharp and away with the flying gang. Then a piercing scream and a rush of steam as the engine moved ahead, with a measured beat by the slum and street of the busy town we fled. By the uplands bright and the homesteads white with the rush of the western gale, and the pilot swayed with the pace we made as she rocked on the ringing rail. 
and the country children clapped their hands as the engine's echoes rang but their elders said there is work ahead when they send for the flying gang then across the miles of the saltbush plain that gleamed with the morning dew where the grasses waved like the ripening grain the pilot engine flew a fiery rush in the open bush where the grade marks seemed to fly and the order sped on the wires ahead the pilot must go by the governor's special must stand aside and the fast express go hang let your orders be that the line is free for the boys of the flying gang end of poem this recording is in the public domain henry purcell by gerard manley hopkins Read for LibriVox.org by John Burlinson. The poet wishes well to the divine genius of Purcell, and praises him that, whereas other musicians have given utterance to the moods of man's mind, he has, beyond that, uttered in notes the very make and species of man as created both in him and in all men generally. Henry Purcell Have fair fallen, O oh, fair, fair, have fallen, so dear to me, so arch a special of spirit as heaves Henry Purcell. An age is now since past, since parted, With the reversal of the outward sentence, Low lays him, listed to a heresy here. Not mood in him, nor meaning, Proud fire, or sacred fear, Or love, or pity, or all but sweet notes not his might nursle. It is the forged feature finds me, it is the rehearsal of own, of abrupt self there so thrusts on, so throngs the ear. Let him, oh, with his air of angels, then lift me, lay me. Only I'll have an eye to the sakes of him, quaint moon marks to his pelted plumage under wings. So some great storm fowl, whenever he has walked his while, the thunder purple sea beach plumed purple of thunder if a wuthering of his palmy snow pinions scatter a colossal smile off him but meaning motion fans fresh our wits with wonder end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Kiss by Thomas More Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira December 2015 Ilian nisi in lecto nusquam potuere doceri Ovid, Book 2, Elegy 5 Give me, my love, that billing kiss I taught you one delicious night When, turning epicures in bliss, we tried inventions of delight. Come, gently steal my lips along, And let your lips in murmurs move. Ah, no, again, that kiss was wrong. How can you be so dull, my love? Cease, cease, the blushing girl replied, And in her milky arms she caught me. How can you thus your pupil chide? You know twas in the dark you taught me. End of poem. This recording 
is in the public domain. Lettuce by Michael Field Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist Little lettuce is dead, they say, The brown, sweet child who rolled in the hay. Ah, where shall we find her? For the neighbours pass to the pretty lass In a linen sealcloth to wind her. If her sister were set to search the nettle green nook beside the church, and the way were shown her through the coffin gate to her dead playmate, she would fly too frightened to own her. Should she come at a noonday call, ah, stealthy, stealthy, with no footfall and no laughing chatter, to her mother twere worse than a barren curse that her own little wench should patter. Little lettuce is dead and gone. Stream by her garden wanders on through the rushes wider. She fretted to know how its bright drops grow on the hills, but no hand would guide her. Little lettuce is dead and lost. Her willow tree boughs by storm are tossed. Oh, the swimming sallows, where she crouched to find the nest of the wind like a waterfowl's in the shallows. Little lettuce is out of sight. The river bed and the breeze are bright. I me were it sinning to dream that she knows where the soft wind rose that her willow branches is thinning. Little lettuce has lost her name, slipped away from our praise and our blame. Let not love pursue her, but conceive her free where the bright drops be on the hills and no longer rue her. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Love Song by William Carlos Williams Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp What have I to say to you when we shall meet? Yet I lie here thinking of you. The stain of love is upon the world, Yellow, 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 it eats into the leaves, smears with saffron the horned branches that lean heavily against a smooth purple sky. There is no light, only a honey-thick stain that drips from leaf to leaf and limb to limb, spoiling the colors of the whole world. I am alone. The weight of love has buoyed me up till my head knocks against the sky. See me, my hair is dripping with nectar, starlings carry it on their black wings. See, at last, my arms and my hands are lying idle. How can I tell if I shall ever love you again, as I do now? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On Monsieur's Departure by Queen Elizabeth I. Read for LibriVox.org by Tony Addison. I grieve and dare not show my discontent. I love and yet am forced to seem to hate. I do, yet dare not say I ever meant. I seem stark mute, but inwardly do prate. I am and not, I freeze, and I am burned, since from myself, another self, I turned. My care is like my shadow in the sun, follows me flying, flies 
when I pursue it, stands and lies by me, doth what I have done, his too familiar care doth make me rue it. No means I find to rid him from my breast, Till by the end of things it be suppressed. Some gentler passion slide into my mind, For I am soft and made of melting snow, Or be more cruel, love, and so be kind. Let me or float or sing, be high or low, or let me live with some more sweet content, or die, and so forget what love e'er meant. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Negro Speaks of Rivers by Langston Hughes. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world, and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo, and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. It is not growing like a tree by Ben Johnson read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. It is not growing like a tree in bulk doth make man better be, or standing long an oak three hundred year to fall a log at last, dry, bald, and sear. A lily of a day is fairer far in May, Although it fall and die that night. It was the plant and flower of light. In small proportions we just beauties see, And in short measures life may perfect be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Orator's Complaint by Robert Fuller Murray Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk How many the troubles that wait on mortals, especially those who endeavor in eloquent prose to expound their views and orate! Did you ever attempt to speak when you hadn't a word to say? Did you find that it wouldn't pay and subside, feeling dreadfully weak? Did you ever, when going ahead, in a fervid defense of the stage, get checked in your noble rage by somehow losing your thread? Did you ever rise to reply to a toast, say, the volunteers, and evoke loud laughter and cheers when you didn't exactly know why? Did you ever wax witty, and when you had smashed an opponent quite small, did he seem not to mind it at all? but get up and smash you again. 
if any or all of these things have happened to you as to me i think you'll be found to agree with yours truly when sadly he sings how many the troubles that wait on mortals especially those who endeavor in eloquent prose to expound their views and orate end of poem this recording is in the public domain Prime by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira December 2015 Your voice is like bells over roofs at dawn When a bird flies and the sky changes to a fresher colour Speak, speak, beloved Say little things for my ears to catch And run with them to my heart End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Request by Lawrence Hope. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. Give me yourself one hour. I do not crave for any love or even thought of me. Come. As a sultan may caress a slave and then forget forever, utterly. Come, as west winds that, passing cool and wet, or desert places leave them fields in flower, and all my life, for I shall not forget, will keep the fragrance of that perfect hour. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sappho to Phaon A new rendering of Ovid's Heroic Epistle 15 By Sappho Read for LibriVox.org By Tony Addison one phaon most lovely closest to my heart can your dear eyes forget or must i stand confessed in name beloved that thou art lost to my touch and in another land sappho now calls thee lyre and lyric muse forgotten and the tears born of her wrongs blinding her eyes upturned but to refuse phoebus the fountain of all joyous songs i burn as when in swiftness past the byres flame takes the corn borne by the winds that blow for what are etna's flames to my desires thou who by etna wanderest o oh, thou the lyric muse has turned as I from her, peace, peace alone can join us once again. The blue sea in its solitude lies fair, but desolate I turn from it in pain. No more the girls of Lesbos move my heart. My blameless love for them is now no more. Before my love for thee all loves depart cold wanderer thou upon a distant shore oh thou art lovely wert thou garbed like him apollo by thy side a shade would be garland thy tresses with the ivy dim and bacchus would be less himself by thee apollo yet who bent as bacchus fell one to the cretan one to daphne's fire beside me what are they i cast my spell o'er seas and lands the music of my lyre echoes across the world where mortals dwell renders the earth in tune with my desire alcaeus strikes olympus 
with his song. Boldly and wild, his music finds its star. Unto the human does my voice belong, and Aphrodite smiles on me from far. Have I no charms? Has genius lost her touch to turn simplicity to beauty's zone? Am I so small, whose towering height is such that in the world of men I stand alone? Yea, I am brown, an Ethiopian's face turned Perseus from his path, a flame of fire, white doves or dark, which hath the finer grace, are they not equal, netted by desire? If by no charm, except thine own sweet charm, thou canst be moved, are then alas for me fires of the earth thy coldness will not warm and phaon's self must phaon's lover be yet once ah once forgetful of the world you lay engirdled by this world of mine those nights remain be earth to darkness hurled deathless as passion's ecstasy divine, my songs around you were the only birds, my voice the only music, in your fire with kisses burning yet, you killed my words, and found my kisses sweeter than desire. I filled you with delight, when close embraced, in the last act, of love i gave you heaven and yet again delirious as we faced and yet again till in exhaustion even love's self half died and nothing more remained but earth and life half lost and heaven gained and now, Sicilian girls, O oh, heart of mine, Why was I born so far from Sicily? Sicilian girls, unto my words incline, Beware of smiles, of insincerity, Beware the words that once belonged to me, The fruits of passion, and the seeds of grief, O oh, Cyprian, by the fair Sicilian sea, Sappho now calls thee, Turn to her relief. Shall fortune still pursue me, luckless one, With hounds of woe pursue me down the years? Sorrow was mine since first I saw the sun, The ashes of my parents knew my tears. My brother cast the gifts of life away, For one unworthy of all gifts but gold. Grief follows grief, and on this woeful day an infant daughter in my arms I hold. Fates, what more can ye do, what more assay? Phaon, ah, yes, he is the last I know, the first, the all, the grave that once was gay, the dark veil on my purple robe ye throw, my curls no more are curls, nor scent the air with perfume from the flowers Egyptians grow. The gold that bound these locks of mine so fair has parted for the wind these locks to blow. All arts of love were mine when he was by, whose son is now the son of Sicily. Phaon, when I was born, the mystic three called Aphrodite on my birth to gaze, and then the Cyprian turning called on thee to be my fate and fill my dreams and days. Thou for whose sake Aurora's eyes might turn from Cephalus, or Cynthia give thee sleep, pouring oblivion from night's marble urn, bidding Endymion to watch thy sheep. 
Lo, as I write, I weep, and naught appears but love, half failed by broken words and tears. You, you, who left me without kiss or tear or word, to murmur softly like a child, begotten of thy voice, deception were less cruel far than silence, you who smiled falsely so often, had you no false phrase, you who so often had false tales to tell, no voice there at the parting of our ways, to say farewell, O oh love, or oh just farewell. I had no gift to give you when you passed, and wrongs were all the gifts received from thee. I had no words to tell you at the last, but these, forget not life, forget not me. And when I heard, told by some casual tongue, that thou wert gone, grief turned me then to stone. Voiceless I stood, as though I ne'er had sung, pulseless and lost, for evermore alone, without a sigh, without a tear to shed, grief held me, grief, who has no word to say. Then, rising as one rises from the dead, my soul broke forth as one breaks forth to slay, rending and wounding all this frame of mine, cursing the gods, the moments and the years, now like the clouds of storm, where lightnings shine, uplifted, then resolving into tears. Debased, when turns my brother in his scorn, my grief to laughter, pointing to my child, till madness takes me, as the fire the corn, and in reviling thee, I stand reviled. Ah, but at night, at night I turn to thee, In dreams our limbs are joined as flame with flame, In dreams again your arms are girdling me, I taste your soul in joys I blush to name. Ah, but the day that follows on the night, The emptiness that drives me to the plain, To seek those spots that knew my lost delight, the grotto that shall shield us not again. Here lies the grass we pressed in deeds of love, Lips, limbs, and twine, I kiss the ground to-day, The herbs lie withered, and the birds that move Are songless, and the very trees are grey. Night takes the day, and falls upon the groves, The nightingale alone, is left to cry, lamenting in the song that sorrow loves. To Tereus she calls, to Phaon I. 2. There is a spring through whose cool water shows the sand like silver, clear as seen through air. There is a spring above whose mirror grows A lotus like a grove in flower fair. Here as I lay in tears a spirit stood, Born of the water, then she called to me, Sappho pursuing love by grief pursued, Sappho Beside the blue Leucadian sea there stands a rock, And there above the caves whose wandering echoes Reach Apollo's fane, down leaping to the blue And breaking waves, lovers find sleep, Nor dream of love again. Deucalion here found ease from Pyrrha's scorn, Sappho arise, and where the sharp cliffs fall, Thy body, that had better not been born, Cast to the waves, 
the blue, blue waves that call. I rise, and weeping silently I go. My fear is great, my love is greater still. Better oblivion than the love I know. Kinder than Phaon's is the blue wave's will. Ye favouring breezes, guard me on this day. Love, lend your pinions, waft me o'er the sea, Where lovely Phoebus on thy shrine I'll lay, My lyre, with this inscription unto thee. Sappho to Phoebus consecrates her lyre, And to the god the gift the fire to fire. 3. Alas, and woe is me, but must I go? O Phaon, Phoebus' self to me is less than Phaon. Will you cast me down below, all broken, for the cruel rocks to press this breast that left thee ruined? Ah, the song Born of the muses leaves me, and the lyre is voiceless, they no more to me belong, and in this darkness dies the heavenly fire. Farewell, ye girls of Lesbos, fare ye well. No more the grove shall answer to my song, no more these hands shall wake the lyre to tell of love, of life, to Phaon they belong, and he has fled. O loveliness, return, make once again my soul to sing in joy, feed once again this heart with fires that burn, gods can no prayers avail but to destroy, no songs bring back the lost, no sighs recall the lost that was, my love, my life, my all. Return, return, raise to the wind thy sail, Across the sea bring back to me the years. Here I shall lend to thee the favouring gale. The track is sure where Aphrodite steers. Let thy white sail be lifted on the rim of sky that marks the dark dividing seas. Failing that far-off sail, remain the dim blue depths where once Deucalion found release. Failing that far-off sail, the wave shall give death or forgetfulness whilst still I live. End of Sappho to Phaon A new rendering of Ovid's Heroic Epistle 15 This recording is in the public domain. The Snow Fairy by Claude McKay Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Throughout the afternoon I watched them there, Snow fairies falling, falling from the sky, Whirling fantastic in the misty air, Contending fierce for space supremacy. And they flew down a mightier force at night, as though in heaven there was revolt and riot, and they, frail things, had taken panic flight down to the calm earth, seeking peace and quiet. I went to bed, and rose at early dawn to see them huddled together in a heap, each merged into the other upon the lawn, worn out by the sharp struggle, fast asleep. The sun shone brightly on them half the day. By night they stealthily had stolen away. And suddenly my thoughts then turned to you, Who came to me upon a winter's night, When snow sprites round my attic window flew, Your hair dishevelled, eyes aglow with light. My heart was like the weather when you came, 
the wanton winds were blowing loud and long but you with joy and passion all aflame you danced and sang a lilting summer song i made room for you in my little bed took covers from the closet fresh and warm a downful pillow for your scented head and lay down with you resting in my arm you went with dawn you left me ere the day the lonely actor of a dreamy play end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet fifty three by william shakespeare read for librivox dot org by tony addison what is your substance whereof are you made that millions of strange shadows on you tend since every one hath every one one shade and you but one can every shadow lend describe adonis and the counterfeit is poorly imitated after you on helen's cheek all art of beauty set and you in grecian tires are painted new speak of the spring and foison of the year the one doth shadow of your beauty show the other as your bounty doth appear and you in every blessed shape we know in all external grace you have some part but none like you you none for constant heart and a poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet 7 from 8 sonnets oh oh you will be sorry for that word by edna st vincent millay Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira December 2015 Oh, oh, you will be sorry for that word. Give back my book and take my kiss instead. Was it my enemy or my friend I heard? What a big book for such a little head. Come, I will show you now my newest hat. And you may watch me purse my mouth and prink. Oh, I shall love you still and all of that. I never again shall tell you what I think. I shall be sweet and crafty, soft and sly. You will not catch me reading any more. I shall be called a wife to pattern by. And some day, when you knock and push the door, some sane day, not too bright, and not too stormy i shall be gone and you may whistle for me end of poem this recording is in the public domain the storm by john Donne, read for LibriVox.org by thomas copeland to mr christopher brook thou which art i tis nothing to be so thou which art still thyself by these shalt know part of our passage and a hand or eye by hilliard drawn is worth an history by a worse painter made and without pride when by thy judgment they are dignified my lines are such tis the preeminence of friendship only to impute excellence england to whom we owe what we be and have sad that her sons did seek a foreign grave for fates or fortunes drifts none can sooth say honour and misery have one face and way from out her pregnant entrails 
sighed a wind which at theirs middle marble room did find such strong resistance that itself it threw downward again and so when it did view how in the port our fleet dear time did lease withering like prisoners which lie but for fees mildly it kissed our sails and fresh and sweet as to a stomach starved whose insides meat meat comes it came and swole our sails when we so joyed as sarah her swelling joyed to see but twas but so kind as our countrymen which bring friends one day's way and leave them then then like two mighty kings which dwelling far asunder meet against a third to war the south and west winds joined and as they blew waves like a rolling trench before them threw sooner than you read this line did the gale like shot not feared till felt our sails assail and what at first was called a gust the same hath now a storm's anon a tempest's name jonas i pity thee and curse those men who when the storm raged most did wake thee then sleep is pain's easiest sad and doth fulfil all offices of death except to kill but when i waked i saw that i saw not i and the sun which should teach me had forgot east west day night and i could only say if the world had lasted now it had been day thousands our noises were yet we amongst all could none by his right name but thunder call lightning was all our light and it rained more than if the sun had drunk the sea before some coffin did their cabins lie equally grieved that they are not dead and yet must die and as sin-burdened souls from graves will creep at the last day some forth their cabins peep and tremblingly ask what news and do hear so like jealous husbands what they would not know some sitting on the hatches would seem there with hideous gazing to fear away fear then note they the ship's sicknesses the mast shaked with this ague and the hold and wast with a salt dropsy clogged and all our tacklings snapping like two high stretched treble strings and from our tottered sails rags drop down so as from one hanged in chains a year ago even our ordinance placed for our defence strive to break loose and scape away from thence pumping hath tired our men and what's the gain seas into seas thrown we suck in again hearing hath deft our sailors and if they knew how to hear there's none knows what to say compared to these storms death is but a qualm hell somewhat lightsome and the bermuda calm darkness lights elder brother his birthright claims all this world and to heaven hath chased light all things are one and that one none can be since all forms uniform deformity doth cover so that we except god say another fiat shall have no more day so violent yet long these furies be that though thine absence starve me i wish not thee End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Calm by John Dunn. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Copeland. Our storm is past, and that storm's tyrannous rage a stupid calm, but nothing it doth swage. The fable is inverted and far more a block afflicts now than a stork before storms chafe and soon wear out themselves or us in calms heaven laughs to see us languish thus as steady as i can wish that my thoughts were smooth as my mistress glass or what shines there the sea is now and as the isles which we seek when we can move our ships rooted be as water did in storms now pitch runs out as lead when a fired church becomes one spout and all our beauty and our trim decays like courts removing or like ended plays the fighting place now seamen's rags supply and all the tackling is a frippery 
no use of lanterns, and in one place lay feathers and dust today and yesterday. Earth's hollownesses, which the world's lungs are, have no more wind than the upper vault of air. We can nor lost friends nor sought foes recover, but meteor-like, save that we move not, hover. Only the calendar together draws dear friends, which meet dead in great fishes' jaws. And on the hatches, as on altars, lies each one his own priest and own sacrifice. Who live, that miracle to multiply where walkers in hot ovens do not die. If in despite of these we swim, that hath no more refreshing than our brimstone bath, but from the sea into the ship we turn like parboiled wretches on the coals to burn. Like Bajazet encaged, the shepherds scoff, or like slack-sinewed Samson as hair off languish our ships. Now, as a myriad of ants durst the emperor's loved snake invade, the crawling galleys, sea jails, finny chips, might brave our pinnaces, now bedrid ships, whether a rotten state and hope of gain, or to disuse me from the queasy pain of being beloved and loving, or the thirst of honour, or fair death, outpushed me first. I lose my end, for here, as well as I, a desperate may live, and a coward die. Stag, dog, and all which from or towards flies, is paid with life, or prey, or doing dies. Fate grudges us all, and doth subtly lay a scourge against which we all forget to pray. He that at sea prays for more wind, as well under the poles might beg cold, heat in hell. What are we then? How little more, alas, is man now than before he was. He was nothing. For us, we are for nothing fit. Chance, or ourselves, still disproportionate. We have no power, no will, no sense. I lie. I should not then thus feel this misery. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Story of Mongrel Grey by A. B. Banjo Patterson. Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles. The Story of Mongrel Grey. This is the story the stockman told On the cattle camp when the stars were bright The moon rose up like a globe of gold And flooded the plain with her mellow light We watched the cattle till dawn of day And he told me the story of Mongrel Grey He was a knockabout station hack Spurred and walloped and banged and beat Ridden all day with a sore on his back, Left all night with nothing to eat. That was a matter of every day, Common occurrence to Mongrel Grey. We might have sold him, but someone heard, He was bred out back on a flooded run, Where he learnt to swim like a water bird, Midnight or midday were all as one. In the flooded ground he could find his way, Nothing could puzzle old Mongrel Grey. Tis a special gift that some horses learn. When the floods are out, they will splash along in girth deep water and twist and turn from hidden channel and billabong, never mistaking the road to go, for a man may guess, but the horses know. I was camping out with my youngest son, bit of a nipper just learnt to speak, in an empty hut on the lower run shooting and fishing in Conroy's Creek. The youngster toddled about all day, and with our horses was Mongrel Grey. All of a sudden the flood came down, fresh from the hills with the mountain rain, roaring and eddying, rank and brown, over the flats and across the plain. Rising and rising at fall of night, nothing but water appeared in sight. 
Tis a nasty place when the floods are out, even in daylight, for all around, channels and billabongs twist about, stretching for miles in the flooded ground, and to move was a hopeless thing to try, in the dark with the water just racing by. I had to try it, I heard a roar, and the wind swept down with the blinding rain, and the water rose till it reached the floor of our highest room, and t'was very plain. The way the water was sweeping down, we must shift for the highlands at once, or drown. Off to the stable I splashed and found, the horses shaking with cold and fright. I led them down to the lower ground, but never a yard would they swim that night. They reared and snorted and turned away, and none would face it but Mongrel Grey. I bound the child on the horse's back, and we started off with a prayer to heaven, through the rain and the wind and the pitchy black, for I knew that the instinct God has given to guide his creatures by night and day would lead the footsteps of Mongrel Grey. He struck deep water at once and swam, I swam beside him and held his mane, till we touched the bank of the broken dam, in shallow water, then off again, swimming in darkness across the flood, rank with the smell of the drifting mud. He turned and twisted across and back, choosing the places to wade or swim, picking the safest and shortest track. The pitchy darkness was clear to him. Did he strike the crossing by sight or smell? The Lord that led him alone could tell. He dodged the timber whene'er he could, but the timber brought us to grief at last. I was partly stunned by a log of wood that struck my head as it drifted past, and I lost my grip of the brave old grey, and in half a second he swept away. I reached a tree where I had to stay, and did a perish for two days hard, and lived on water, but Mongrel Grey, he walked right into the homestead yard, at dawn next morning, and grazed around, with the child on top of him, safe and sound. We keep him now for the wife to ride, nothing too good for him now, of course, never a whip on his fat old hide, for she owes the child to that old grey horse. And not old Tyson himself could pay the purchase money of Mongrel Grey. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Spider by Samuel Lowe Read for LibriVox.org by John Burlinson I like thee not, Arachne. Thou art base, perfidious, merciless, and full of guile, cruel and false, like many of our race, voracious as the monster of the Nile. Thou villain insect, well do I perceive the treacherous web thy murderous fangs have wrought, and yet so fine and subtle dost thou weave that heedless innocence perceives it not. In now I see thee sit, pretending sleep, yet dost thou eager watch the livelong day with squinting eyes which never know to weep, prepared to spring upon unguarded prey. Ill fares it with the unwary little fly or gnat, ensnared by thy insidious loom. In thy envenomed jaws the wretch must die, to glut thy loathsome carcass is his doom. Instinctive is my terror at thy sight. Oft, ugly reptile, I have shunned thy touch. Nor do I wonder thou shouldst thus affright, since thou resemblest vicious man so much. Like him thy touch, thy very look, can blight. But not the spider species dost thou kill, while spite of duty, e'en in God's despite, 
man is to man the surest sorest ill end of poem this recording is in the public domain youth renewed by robert fuller murray read for LibriVox.org by bruce kachuk when one who has wandered out of the way which leads to the hills of joy whose heart has grown both cold and gray though it be but the heart of a boy when such a one turns back his feet from the valley of shadow and pain is not the sunshine passing sweet when a man grows young again how gladly he mounts up the steep hillside with strength that is born anew and in his veins like a full springtide the blood streams through and through and far above is the summit clear and his heart to be there is fain and all too slowly it comes more near when a man grows young again he breathes the pure sweet mountain breath and it widens all his heart and life seems no more kin to death nor death the better part and in tones that are strong and rich and deep he sings a grand refrain for the soul has awakened from mortal sleep when a man grows young again end of poem this recording is in the public domain Zero in Captivity by Lawrence Hope Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist Love me a little, Lord, or let me go. I am so weary walking to and fro Through all your lonely halls that were so sweet Did they but echo to your coming feet. When by the flowered scrolls of lace-like stone Our women's windows I am left alone, across the yellow desert, looking forth, I see the purple hills towards the north. Behind those jagged mountains' lilac crest once lay the captive bird's small rifled nest. There was my brother slain, my sister bound, his blood, her tears, drunk by the thirsty ground. Then, while the burning village smoked on high and desecrated all the peaceful sky, they took us captive, us, born frank and free, on fleet, strong camels through the sandy sea. Yet when we rested, night times on the sand, by the rare waters of this weary land, our captors, ere the camp was wrapped in sleep, talked, and I listened, and forgot to weep. Is he not brave and fair? they asked our king slender as one tall palm tree by a spring erect serene with gravely brilliant eyes as deeply dark as are these desert skies truly no bitter fate they said and smiled awaits the beauty of this captured child then something in my heart began to sing and secretly i longed to see the king Sometimes the other maidens sat in tears, sometimes, consoled, they jested at their fears, musing what lovers time to them would bring. But I was silent, thinking of the king. Till, when the weary, endless sands were past, when, far to south, the city rose at last, all speech forsook me and my eyelids fell, since I already loved my lord so well. Then the division, some were sent away to merchants in the city, some, they say, to summer palaces beyond the walls, but me they took straight to the sultan's halls. Every morning I would wake and say, Ah, sister, shall I see our lord today? The women robed me, perfumed me, and smiled. When were his feet on fleet to pleasure, child? And tales they told me of his deeds in war, of how his name was reverenced afar, and crouching closer in the lamp's faint glow they told me of his beauty speaking low what need what need the women wasted art i loved you with every fibre of my heart already my god when did i not love you in life in death when shall i not love you 
you never seek me all day long i lie watching the changes of the far-off sky beneath the lattice-work of carven stone and all night long alas i lie alone but you come never ah oh, my lord the king how can you find it well to do this thing come once come only sometimes as i lie i doubt if i shall see you first or die ah could i hear your footsteps at the door hallow the lintel and caress the floor then i might drink your beauty satisfied die of delight ere you could reach my side alas you come not lord life's flame burns low faint for a loveliness it may not know faint for your face oh come come soon to me lest though you should not death should set me free End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.